Coal mining has always been a dangerous game. But in Yorkshire, England, back in 1866, a major mine became a chamber of horrors for hundreds of rough hewn miners. A colliery is a coal mine, and the Oaks Colliery was a 450 acre site with 60 miles of mining tunnels running beneath it. Narrow passageways and black walls zigzag through a vein of coal 40 stories below the surface. Boring through the black earth was dangerous enough. It was a job plagued by roof collapses, machine accidents, lack of air, and other significant industrial hazards. But perhaps the greatest risk came from fire damps. Pockets of pressurized methane entombed in a vein of coal, like landmines, ready to explode on first contact with a miner. Even without a spark to ignite a fire, a fire damp could blast out a rush of toxic gas so powerful it could extinguish a quarter mile of tunnel lamps and plunge the miners into total blackness in a chamber full of deadly fumes. On December 12th, 1866, a fire damp would ignite one of the worst disasters in coal mining history. The Oaks Colliery had two long vertical chutes to access the deep labyrinth of tunnels. Men were routinely lowered down the 400-foot shaft in a six-man cage. At 1.20 that afternoon, just before the ship was about to change, a deafening thunderclap boomed across the town of Barnsley as an earthquake rattled buildings up to three miles away. Two dense columns of smoke rose from the Oaks Colliery mine shafts. At that moment, 340 men and boys were trapped underground. They couldn't be brought up because the blast had smashed the transport cages and the scaffolding at the top of the shafts that supported them. Nobody knew if any of the hundreds of workers down in the stifling darkness were still alive. What they also didn't know was that the fiery blast had started fires that were working their way down mile-long corridors of coal and detonating fire damps as they went. They turned a tunnel fire into a subterranean war zone of gas explosions. This would go on for another week, even as rescue teams dared to go down and search for survivors. The Oaks Collier was considered dangerous well before the explosion. A decade earlier, 400 strikers had demanded safer standards. Nothing was done, and many of the strikers were replaced. The government had not inspected the mine for years. Workers often felt giddy and faint from the fumes. Some refused to carry their lamps into the deeper recesses, bearing pockets of methane that could roar into a firewall. The company's response was to have supervisors write, quote, fire in chalk at the risky sites. This negligence led to the Oaks Mine disaster. On day one of the rescue operation, one of the mine owners, a supervisor, and a deputy all descended into shaft number one in a repaired cage. After long, claustrophobic minutes of sliding into deeper darkness, they reached the bottom. There, searching by lamplight, they discovered 20 badly burned workers. They immediately sent them up in the cage. Only 14 would survive. Throughout the course of the day, dozens of men went into the mine and recovered about 80 workers in total by that afternoon. Only 19 of them were still alive, and only six ultimately survived. Most of them died from carbon monoxide poisoning, 
because they were trapped in the mine with ventilators that had broken down. As horrifying as the situation was underground, chaos broke out on the surface. Bystanders had gathered around the shaft to watch the action and angrily jeered rescuers who backed off from going down because of the foul air rising from the pit. The agitated mob began to interfere with the rescue and extra police had to be called in to bring the situation under control. Engineering experts were called in from neighboring operations. Parkin Jeffcock was chief among them, and it was he who led the rescue efforts late into that first night. He himself descended into the mine around 10 p.m. He managed to discover the pocket of toxic gases causing the foul air, and he labored through the night to restore ventilation for anyone who might still be alive. Jeffcock did not want the mine to become a mass grave, but rescue efforts were restricted by roof collapses and gas leaks, and by this time, most responders were certain that any of the 200-plus miners still unaccounted for were probably dead. At 5 a.m. on day two of the rescue, one of the mine supervisors organized 100 men to search and recover bodies all while Jeffcock remained below working on the ventilation. Suddenly, at 8.30 a.m., a massive explosion more powerful than the first shook the town and blasted the cage scaffolding right off the top of shaft number one. While timber was hurled into the air up above, a powerful wind knocked around a small rescue team that was still deep in the shaft. Down at the very bottom, rescuers reacted by scrambling in panic to the cage to be lifted out. They didn't know that the cage and the scaffolding had been destroyed. Later, another cage that was still intact was used to haul up 16 men, all crammed into a space made for six. Sadly, the effort was largely futile. The pace of rescue was so slow that the men waiting for their turn at the bottom simply found shelter in the mine and said their goodbyes. Up above, they lowered the cage back down again, but this time, nobody came up. 28 of the rescuers, including Jeff Cock himself, were dead. At 7.40 that night, a third explosion, this time in shaft number two, sent a gust of black smoke into the sky. The situation was out of control. By this time, the disaster was national news, and even Queen Victoria sent a telegram of support to the site. Unknown to anyone but himself, rescuer Samuel Brown was still alive hundreds of feet below the surface. While searching through the tunnels near the bottom of shaft number one, The second blast knocked him unconscious. He eventually recovered. Peering through the dimly lit cavern as he came to, he discovered to his horror that all of his colleagues were dead. In the early hours of day three, rescuers lowered a bucket with a bottle of brandy into shaft number one. It came up with the bottle removed Everyone was shocked to realize that someone was still alive down there. And if one survived, maybe the hundreds of workers still trapped underground could be alive as well. With the cage unusable, desperate to act, they sent down a rescue team by having two men stand each with one foot in the bucket, which they then lowered into the earth. It was frighteningly unstable. The men swung around wildly. They became dizzy, and they were battered against the mine shaft walls. It took over 15 minutes to lower them down to the bottom. When they got there, they found none other than Samuel Brown, still alive. They quickly brought him back up, 
but their searching turned up no more survivors. Day four of the rescue was rocked by six more explosions. A chain reaction had been sparked as the fire burned through passageways of coal, igniting fire damps. And each explosion would then fuel more tunnel fires. Experts concluded that even with hundreds still in the mine, they had no choice but to seal the shafts and smother the runaway flames. The decision meant that whether or not there were still survivors below, they were doomed. The two mines were finally capped, but the explosions continued for another week. No one knows if there were workers still alive to hear them. The mine shafts were sealed for a year. They were opened back up in December of 1867. Only then was another recovery team sent down. For days later, they performed the grisly work of hauling up to 150 bodies through the shafts. Some were still identifiable, but many were not and were simply buried in a mass grave. There were 17 explosions in all, Nearly 200 men are still accounted for and permanently entombed beneath the surface. The victims left behind 167 widows and 366 children. Even worse, the ages of the victims ranged from 67 down to age 10. This, along with other mining disasters at the time, took out much of the able-bodied male population in the region. For entire towns, the breadwinners and their sons were gone. They never did discover the cause of the original explosion. But until 1913, the Oaks Mine disaster was the worst in British history. My name is Scott, and thank you so much for watching. We are a group of curious and passionate humans, creating documentary-style content for those who share our curiosity, ask questions, and seek to dig deeper in a world where almost everything isn't quite what it seems. We are Mystery Syndicate. If you like what we do, please consider subscribing to our YouTube channel, leave a comment, and give this video a like. And to be notified when we post new videos, hit that notification bell. Also, check us out on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, and for exclusive merchandise and our blog, visit our website at www.mysterysyndicate.com. For those that wish to support our channel, please visit Mystery Syndicate on Patreon. We have a variety of new patron tiers with tons of great benefits. If you want to see your name on a future video, be sure to check it out. From all of us at Mystery Syndicate, thank you again. We sincerely appreciate your support.